Coming up on the social hour, Marissa Meyer is going to turn Yahoo around. That's what people are hoping anyway. Dig is being rebuilt from the ground up in a really short period of time. And digitize your old photos with your iPhone. All that and something called Flipagram. Can you guess? Up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 69, recorded Friday, July 20th, 2012. This episode of the Social Hour is brought to you by Ford, featuring the My Ford mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. The My Ford mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Social Hour from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from Prince Edward Island, Canada, where uh, I am spending my very last day of holiday. And then it's back to the big city of Toronto. How are you doing, Sarah? Amber, I am good. Uh, it's been it's been a, a full week of tech news here at Twit. And um, we're still sort of getting used to our new time. Anybody who's watching us live... Um, and has been watching us live for a while, knows that last week was our first week at our new time slot, Fridays at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Both Amber and I so far are feeling pretty good about the time change. We feel like we've got sort of the whole week to gather stories that seem relevant for the show. Um, Mondays were fine, but Fridays seem better. So um, hopefully they're better or at least as good for everyone else as well. And yeah, Amber, I mean, I'm really- sorry that your vacation is about to end. It's okay, sir. I've had a great time while I've been here, so I cannot complain at all. And uh, like you said, I think uh, doing the show on Fridays is a much better idea. And uh, it's amazing how much social media news collects over the week. And there really is an excess of news this week. I think there were, I could have added you know, twice as many links as I did to the rundown. I know you have a lot of great stuff as well. Unfortunately, we do have to start with the really sad story of the shooting in Colorado, where uh, it has been confirmed that 12 people were killed. And I think as many as 50 were injured recently. And we're we're just going to focus for a couple in the minutes. Seventies. Seventies now. Yeah. Okay, just to focus a couple of minutes on um, some of the social media side of what happened, particularly with some big social media snafus from a couple of different companies on Twitter. Yeah. So, f- for the purposes of our show, uh, we certainly want to focus on the social media aspect of it, as Amber mentioned, because we 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 kind of have to. And I think this is the sort of situation where when there are big news events, especially news events that are currently unfolding, um, social media is a great way to spread information and a great way to spread misinformation. And often there are mistakes that are made either by individuals or companies that will get called out. I think partly because you can say something very ignorant uh, because you don't really understand the way Twitter works or because you're not aware of the situation. um, And then you kind of get at this ripple effect of people getting angry and then it becomes a story in its own right. Uh, The first uh, tweet uh, that I noticed people were retweeting with with, uh, additions like, I can't believe that they would say this, this is so, uh, you know, like a reckless thing, is the official uh, NRA account. It was a, it was um, a tweet that I suspect was probably set up well ahead of time, some sort of a timed tweet that said, Good morning, shooters. Um, yeah, happy Friday. Any plans this weekend? I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's that's pretty much what it said. Now, of course, you see something like that, and you say, "Oh, I mean, the NRA of all of, of all places. This is some you know account NRA underscore ri- rifle man. Um, that's that's how could how could they do that? Again, yeah. it, it's it's. It's it's not. I never saw this and thought, "Wow, they're really just sticking it to everybody who's having a hard time processing these events." Amber, what about you? 
Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. I first saw the tweet from, uh, I believe it is Anthony DeRosa, if that's correct, from Reuters, the social one of the social media editors over there. Saw it a few hours ago and I shared it. And I've had a lot of comments and feedback uh, from people on Twitter and just had, had some time to really think about it. Uh, CNN also wrote an article about that particular tweet. And I think the issue here is um, the NRA did respond saying that uh, it was an individual who sent out the tweet who hadn't had a chance to read the news. So it looks kind of like perhaps it was not an auto tweet. Uh, however, I think this is a lesson for any organization when you're sending out any type of auto tweets or you're sending anything out there and your organization is somewhat controversial to start with, mm -hmm. that perhaps it's a good idea to really dive into it news headlines before you put anything out into the public space. And I think that would be the lesson for the NRA with this particular message that they put out there, uh, which is from the official NRA journal, is that because of the nature of the organization, they really have to have a better sense of breaking news and what people are saying, uh, whether it's uh, on TV or on radio about big events of the day. So um, I think that they should have been a little bit more sensitive to that. And um, I think also it looks like they've pulled down their account, or at least they did earlier today, altogether. And uh, they didn't issue any any apology on their Twitter account, but the account was completely gone from Twitter, which is also not the best reaction and the best way to deal with this. Uh, instead, it would have been a good idea to perhaps delete the account and to come out and offer their condolences for the families of some of the victims. And uh, maybe that's asking too much. However, it would have been a nice gesture. I agree. Deleting tweets, and I delete tweets all the time because I'll type out something. I realized I've made a typo. I, you know, I... I I usually redo it, and, and I hope that very few people even notice the difference. But often, something is tweeted that ends up either being inappropriate, in poor taste, a mistake, and it goes away. And the problem is, is that usually, by, by the time that it goes away for whatever reason, enough people have captured it, so it almost makes it look worse. And I'm not saying that People shouldn't delete tweets if they're inappropriate. You can you can do whatever you want. But yeah, there is some context that is lost, especially with people who are hearing the story from us now and thinking, well, you know, where where is that tweet? You know, you, you can find it on an article, but it's just it's a screen grab of a tweet that no longer exists, and that really just kind of adds to confusion. Again, spread of misinformation and speculation on what may or may not have happened. Somebody in chat asked a couple minutes ago. Well, this seems like a really good excuse, a really good reason not to time your tweets because it, this, you're right, Amber, this doesn't sound like this was a case of a tweet being timed, just somebody who wasn't aware of the situation. But if it had been timed, same idea. I mean, yesterday, it was a very different day than today. I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think that it's just, uh, all that more of a reason to, like you said, be on top of what your message mm -hmm. is and be able to, jump in and, and respond appropriately if necessary. Um, some people don't believe in time tweets at all. I think that there is a time and place for those uh, yeah. in, in the right context. Yeah, I think there's a time and place for them. And I, my only argument would be that the NRA is perhaps not an organization that should have time tweets or auto tweets out there because just again, because of the sensitive nature of what they may put out there and also news items that uh, may coincide with some of those messages or tweets. Uh, also, one of our listeners sent us a tweet uh, and I you know, vowed to never talk about Kim, Kim Kardashian in my life. However, uh, we have to due to the nature of this tweet, uh, which is from Celeb Boutique, which I guess Kim Kardashian is a affiliated with them. And um, they had tweeted earlier today, Aurora is trending. That is the city in Colorado where the shooting took place, clearly about Kim Kardashian inspired Aurora dress. And you can shop for it here. Uh, now, this is a little bit reminiscent. If you remember, Sarah, we talked about this, this with Kenneth Cole when he had that really inappropriate tweet about Egypt. I believe it was last year mm -hmm. uh, in the earlier part of the year. And uh, this is this this is even more unbelievable. So I think companies really have to get smart harder uh, and do have to scan headlines if they're putting uh, any type of tweet out there, especially if they have any recognition on the web. Uh, Celeb Boutique has responded to the outcry. I, I think I've probably seen this particular tweet more than almost anything else that, of, of a single link that was shared today, just because it seemed so outland... I mean, just unbelievable that a company would use a tragedy in order to sell anything. Um, and certainly in this, it, you know, this, it just it sort of flippantly the way that it was described. Celeb Boutique has responded and said 
this was sent out by our PR agency. They're not based in the U.S. They didn't know what was going on. It's just a horrible, horrible accident. Um, it was not meant to offend. It was just nobody looked and saw why Aurora was trending, and they took it and ran with it, and it was just extremely bad uh, non-research pretty much on our team's part who really isn't part of our team and isn't even based in the country. So, yeah, it was a mistake. It's a really, really bad one, though, um, and a really, really good reason not to have a PR or a social media team that isn't paying attention to why a trending topic is trending. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, maybe this all goes back to one simple uh, statement that more people should just read the news. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, when you're out there in the social media space, it's becoming increasingly important, especially as things get taken the wrong way. So it's key to have a sense of what's going on. Uh, now, Sarah, maybe we can pivot a little, little bit to our next story, because this yes. was also a big story uh, 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 about Shell is Prepared and that Twitter account and the site ArcticReady.com. Uh, uh, com. And it uh, turns out uh, that this was a a massive campaign. It looked like it was run by Shell, the giant energy company. And in fact, it turned out uh, recently, just this week, that it is Greenpeace who is behind all of this controversy uh, about uh, the Twitter account as well as the website itself. Yeah, exactly. So, so many of you may have been following along, particularly on Twitter, and seeing a lot of retweets of an account called Shell is Prepared. What this is about is, oh gosh, I mean, this it's 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 such a it was such a good hoax actually that a lot of my friends actually were were duped uh, before <laughs> I even really understood what was going on I had I had seen a lot of retweets from them the website arctic ready is a parody site not put together by shell at all uh put together by greenpeace and I, I believe another group um that's making light of a situation of of all the terrible things that happen uh through drilling particularly um in the arctic space and It's the sort of thing where, yeah, there's a polar bear with another bear's head in its mouth. That's weird. I mean, when you look at it, you think, okay, something's not right here. (laughs) But a lot of people have limited time, very short attention spans, might have, as we were talking before the show, 24 tabs open and they're not paying that much attention. These are also people who, you know, probably fall for phishing scams, you know, and emails because it looked like that Bank of America logo type of a thing. And so it's easy enough to say, okay, that seems like a legitimate website that's associated with this Twitter account, Shell is Prepared, that is apparently trying to squelch all retweets of these inappropriate uh, images that are on this website. The whole thing is fake, um, but it's very well done. And... Uh, it's clearly a way for Greenpeace to uh, not not just kind of like punk shell because it if it were actually the company acting in this way, um, they would seem really stupid and like they don't know how social media works. For example, telling people not to retweet these images. You can't. You don't have permission to retweet these images. They're not for you. That sort of thing. You know, ineptitude. Uh, but also, kind of, I think, furthers Greenpeace's mission, which is to get the word out that. This is a uh, something that Shell doesn't care about the environment, and they're a big corporation who's who's uh, who's doing the wrong thing. This, of course, is Greenpeace's stance. So, very effective, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think a parody website has to pretty clearly be a parody website mm. in order to sort of slide under the radar of legality, and it's pretty close to me. Yeah, you know, I would urge people if they're interested in the story to uh, listen to uh, the speaking law. I know they just talked about this uh, on the Twit Network and uh, dove into some of the legal implications. Clearly, I'm not a lawyer and nor is Sarah, unless I don't know. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, a case where they kind of took things too far. I understand what they were trying to do, but they just took it a little bit too far. And, and still to this day, continue with the Twitter account and continue to post a bunch of statements there. It's still up. I'm shocked, quite honestly. I mean, I guess Shell, who's aware of the situation now because they've posted, listen, this, is, this isn't this us. The, social, uh, the Twitter account isn't us either. We have nothing to do with any of this. But So they're aware of this. I guess they feel like maybe if they took these accounts down, it would seem like they felt guilty or threatened or maybe it just makes more sense for them to ignore rather than get involved. But I'm kind of shocked that enough people didn't realize it's a fake and probably continue to not um, yeah. that that they wouldn't uh, step in and make sure that they went away. 
Yeah, I went to the... It looks like the official Shell website is just twitter.com slash Shell. And I was trying to see if they had any type of reaction to this Greenpeace campaign. And as far as I can tell, they haven't tweeted in a few days and they haven't really said anything publicly about the campaign. Obviously, I'm sorry, this is a bad pun, but they don't want to add fuel to the fire Mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, make it into a bigger deal than it already uh, is. And uh, it's an interesting debate. You know, some people saying that this is just social activism. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I had someone, a friend of mine, write me and say this is more like social terrorism, really an attack on an organization trying to appear as they're, they're tweeting and corresponding on behalf of that organization. So an interesting debate. We'll see what happens. But uh, as of even just the past five or 10 minutes, Shell is ready. Uh, they've still sent out, I think, a couple of tweets just in, in the past little while. Yeah, They exactly. have not stopped. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really important to, to, to look twice, I guess, um, especially when it comes to social media, because it's just so easy to share things. And uh, these are just a few examples of when that sort of thing does not go well and, and, and the cleanup afterwards. All right, let's move on to some potentially very, very good news, Amber. Uh, At least a lot of folks in Silicon Valley are hoping it's good news. Marissa Meyer uh, formerly uh, VP at Google, has been there at Google for a very long time, is heading to Yahoo as Yahoo's new CEO. Yeah, amazing news. This has really uh, taken over the headlines recently. And uh, I saw so many different uh, headlines, including uh, uh, comments about her being pregnant. It looks like she is pregnant when mm-hmm. she's taken on this role and whether she'll be able to handle it and what she's going to do to Flickr and uh, uh, many other uh, uh, news uh, bites on uh, different blogs across the web. So uh, I don't know, Sarah, what do you think? Do you think this is a good thing for Yahoo? It, it could be, I think. I don't think Yahoo could get any more messed up. So in in a sense... I feel like, sure, uh, Marissa Meyer, uh, who I do not know personally, but I have followed her work um, for a long time now. She's very well respected. Of course, we, we've seen some just because it's such it's such a big story and pretty shocking. There weren't any leaks about the fact that Yahoo was talking to her before it became an official announcement. But then you get the blog post afterwards of, well, former employees say that Meyer's a slave driver and, you know, <laughs> she never goes home. And, and then the whole idea of her uh, being pregnant obviously has, has other people saying, well, this is very interesting timing. According to the board, the Yahoo board, who, uh, who, uh, who unanimously voted in favor of her uh, joining the company at the helm, didn't have a problem with that even though uh, babies do in October. And one would say, well, you know, what if she really has to be part of the company in October more than ever and it's a bad time for her because she has to take some time off. That's all, no one really knows how that works. And and Amber, as you know, people uh, balance uh, work and life in a variety of ways. Um, And a lot of other folks say, you know, this is really kind of cool on Yahoo's part. It puts them in a pretty positive light for people who are family oriented, who believe that, um, you know, women can do it all uh, and juggle uh, a lot of different things at once. Uh, Marissa Meyer is an extremely smart and capable woman and Yahoo really needs a smart and capable person. I don't even care about gender uh, right now. And you mentioned Flickr. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was, was kind of great. Um, there was a, uh, again, a sort of a social media push, certainly on Twitter. Um, this was a hashtag that was repeated many, many, many times, thousands of times. Um, the hashtag Dear Marissa Mayer. Um, and it was, for the most part, uh, five words. And it was, uh, Dear, Dear Marissa Mayer, please make Flickr awesome again. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the internet seems pretty positive as far as the news of her uh, joining Yahoo. Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out what she's going to do, what she's going to change there, because like you said, I, I think that they've really gone downhill uh, quite far over the past couple of years, and it'll be a big job to actually pull them up, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time, but uh, interesting to see some Flickr users rally together and uh, push to continue to make Flickr awesome, as well as some of their other tools. So uh, the huge headline in social media news, and uh, it could be a great thing. It- if Marissa Meyer can make Flickr awesome again, she will have succeeded twofold yes. in my eyes. I love Flickr. I'm sad that most of my friends, you know, I've got hundreds of contacts on Flickr. Five of them are maybe posting pictures regularly to Flickr now. 
I'm, I auto post a lot of stuff from Instagram, so it seems like I'm using Flickr quite a bit, but for the most part, there's nothing really there for me these days, and that's very sad to me. I still have, I have massive collections of travel photos, and I mean, I have photos on Flickr that I don't actually have anywhere else, I mean, besides my computer hard drive, and I am, it's a travesty uh, that it's been ignored so long. By the way, Alex had shown um, a, an image of Flickr's response to the Dear Marissa Meyer campaign a couple minutes ago. Uh, they call it Dear Internet. Um, if you go to <laughs> flickr.com slash Dear Internet, it's their, it's their response. Basically saying, for the folks who still work at Flickr, and there are many of them, hey, if you want to make Flickr awesome again, we're hiring. Join hmm. the team. Which is a good response. Well played um, to them. Uh, I'm sure that there are probably uh, some frustrated Flickr employees who can't wait for Flickr to become awesome again. Yeah, I mean, it looks like uh, also as far as uh, Meyer's compensation package, she uh, it's pretty sweet. I, I've read reports up to, I think, $100 million over the course of a, a certain amount of time. And, I think it's, uh, it's $60 million through 2017 if if she's she, if she stays that long if she stays that long yeah. so hopefully she's in it for the long haul and will help to uh, revitalize the company and uh, we'll keep a close eye on this one absolutely all right quick reminder that the social hour is at its new time if you are a live watcher fridays 1 p.m pacific 4 p.m eastern amber and i are here our website is twit.tv slash tsh so if you don't watch us live um, if you're an on-demand viewer or listener, that's great too, but that's where you go if you need to catch up on any of our old episodes. If you loved episode 67 so much and you want to you wanna, uh, remind yourself, what was that one website that Amber talked about that was so great? That's where all of our show notes are, all of our links of everything we talk about is on every one of our episode pages too. If you're not already a subscriber, and by the way, subscriptions are totally free. If for whatever reason that word... Uh, confuses you. Subscriptions are absolutely free. We don't make you pay for any of our content at Twit. You can go ahead and subscribe in iTunes, a variety of other ways, right on all of our episode pages. So um, thanks to everybody who watches us every week. Couldn't do it without you. Um, and before we get into quite a bit more news, Amber's got some tips. Uh, we've got uh, a couple social spotlights. Let's take a moment to thank Ford, who also makes this show possible. Thanks, Ford. Um, What's really cool about Ford, Leo and I were talking about this uh, the other day, is just kind of how futuristic some of the f stuff that Ford offers is, but it's a reality. That's a great thing. I mean, just a few years ago, none of this would have seemed possible. Um, one of those is my Ford mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. You can do things like say, hmm, I'm looking at the weather and it's supposed to be kind of cold tomorrow. I like it to be 74 degrees in my car at all times, so I'm going to go ahead and preset that in my car so that when I get in it in the morning, no matter what the weather is, whether it's hot, it's cold, or, or anything in between, my car is at the perfect temperature. That's the sort of thing that you can do ahead of time, which is awesome. Um, also helps conserve battery energy too. You can monitor charging, you can get alerts, you can find charging stations. So if you're if, if you're still feeling like, ooh, the electric uh, vehicle idea is such a great one, but I feel really nervous about making sure that I'm all charged up, that's also something that you can monitor right from the app, plan out your drive accordingly. You can learn smart driving tips and forums because people love to share when they know stuff, certainly about cars, um, on the My Ford mobile website. There's even some sort of gamification uh, leaderboard. So if you've uh, uh, saved a certain amount of CO2 by not using a certain amount of gas, you can kind of compare yourself to your peers or even strangers. Uh, feel good about yourself if you're up at the top. Achievements. And there's some social networking aspects of, a, as well. And really, if you've got an electric vehicle, you are on the forefront. You are sort of part of this cool club that a lot of people just aren't at yet. And you should know some of some of your, your social peers. It's, it's kind of a good place to connect with people who are like-minded, who care about the same things that you do. The My Ford mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and also efficient. And it's available in the 2012 Ford Focus Electric, which is available for purchase now. If you want to learn more about all of the technological technological goodness that Ford offers, go to Ford.com slash technology. Uh, you'll be impressed, I promise. All right, Amber MacArthur. 
there was uh, there's actually been quite a few acquisitions this week. Mm-hmm. One in 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 particular is social. In fact, they even have the word social in their name. And that's social cam. It's sort of uh, touted as one of those services that was Instagram, but for video just a short time ago, has been acquired by Autodesk. Now, social cam got some mixed reactions because it became the number one application on Facebook very, very quickly. Some say through some spammy measures, 3.7 million daily active users 56 million monthly active users, according to uh, uh, App Data, who measures this sorts of things. Um, all Things Digital notes that these numbers are trending downward. So I, it's the sort of thing where when when um, when Zynga bought uh, OMG Pop, which makes Draw Something, that was sort of at the height of people using Draw <coughs> Something, and user numbers just plummeted after that. Hard to say if that's the same thing that's going to happen with Social Cam, but. If the numbers were continuing to trend downward, the fact that Autodesk buying social cam for sixty million dollars, it's not a billion, but sixty million dollars is a lot, a lot of, money. of money. Yeah. <laughs> you might wonder if that's going to seem like a good idea in another six months. Yeah, you know, it, it does seem like a, an enormous amount of money. I was kind of surprised by uh, how much they actually paid for it. I also wondered a little bit about Autodesk, which makes 3D software, uh, how this sort of fit into what they're doing. I know they've also had other acquisitions over the past few months, but I was curious where they plan to take this. Now, based on some notes we have in the rundown, uh, a great win for Social Cam in that they only have about four employees right now. So a very, very small team, similar to what we saw, saw with Instagram, although they had a few more than that. But uh, I don't know. I still I still find social cam sometimes it can get a little bit irritating in the Facebook environment. I know you touched on that a little bit, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I guess their goal is uh, to try to get at least uh, every person using social cam posting at least once a week and not just using it, you know, once every couple of months. But uh, I don't know if that will become part of my daily routine, but clearly they've, uh, you know, they've attracted enough people in the millions, in fact, who use it on a regular basis. Yes, definitely. I'm still... I am not convinced that that video can catch on the way that photos can ever. Um, and maybe I just haven't seen the right service. Social Cam is a good service. It works just like it sounds. You know, it's, you, you, you have a social network and it's, it's sort of an inline uh, Instagram-ish view. I use Instagram even though there are a lot of different photo apps just because it's so well known. But they're videos. And the problem that I have with that, and this happens on Path because Path is a social network that includes videos as well as just location updates and photos and that sort of thing. But without fail, the videos are, are the uh, updates that I, I'm least likely to click on. Even the photos I will click mm. on because you get a larger view maybe of someone's pretty uh, photo of a sunset and I kind of go, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I'll zoom in a little bit. The videos, I almost never click on them and there's something about video that requires more of, it's like, it's an engagement that I think a lot of us just feel, even if it's psychological, that we don't have time for. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I look at uh, when I'm using my smartphone the most and when I'm engaging and burning through a whole lot of data. And many times it's when I'm standing in the grocery line waiting to get groceries or I'm uh, waiting for someone in a restaurant or in a coffee shop. And and I've said this before on the show, I, I don't really love just randomly clicking on videos because obviously the sound comes up, but I want to take time to put in headphones. And so I tend to veer away from, from looking at videos a lot. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with some of these instant video services because they are there are so many of them that are out there, but uh, I, I don't think they'll go as far as we've seen with anything like text or, or photos as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, another service um, that, well, it, the jury's out on how far it's going to go uh, in its new incarnation is Dig. Uh, the, the story last week was Dig was bought by Betaworks. Um, well, What's the Dig website was bought by DataWorks. Um, some employees have have gone uh, to the Washington Post, and then LinkedIn bought some patents. So part of Dig, pretty much the Dig that is the front facing homepage where there are stories that you that you click on and vote up and down, is what's going to BetaWorks. And BetaWorks has a new a campaign out. I guess you could call it. It's called Rethink Dig, and it is very ambitious. 
Um, they say, as Betaworks and Dig both announced on our blogs, we're taking over Dig, we're turning it back into a startup. What they didn't mention is that we're rebuilding it from scratch in six weeks. They say on August 1st, after an adrenaline and caffeine-fueled six weeks, we're rolling out the new version one with this launch. We're taking the first steps towards remaking <coughs> Dig, the best place to find, read, and share the most interesting and talked about stories on the Internet. And we want your help. Um, links to a survey. They're, they're pretty much saying, listen, we are, we are redoing this whole thing. We, we believe in the future of Dig. We believe that it should be rebuilt from the ground up. And we want to hear what you have to say about it, which is probably going to... Um, come across as a goodwill gesture to a lot of um, Dig users who were turned off by the idea that the Dig team wasn't listening to them. I know that that was one of the main complaints um, and, and why uh, users ended up finding other places to hang out online. It's ambitious, six weeks. I know that if you uh, drink a lot of Red Bull and don't sleep and, and you can achieve all sorts of things in six <laughs> weeks, if we're, we're talking about building projects, but that is really ambitious. Yeah, it's very ambitious. You know, this will be a really fun one to watch, Sarah. I, I can't think in recent history when it comes to social media sites, if there there has been a good example of a company that's kind of dipped and then come back to life uh, and had a, a second chance at uh, making it big on the web. If there there is an example of that, I'd love to know from anyone who's listening or watching. Uh, but it will be fun to watch this one. I love in the uh, little write-up they have on RethinkDig.com where they say, how will Dig make money? And they say, we won't, not yet. <laughs> and they admit that, you know, it's going to take them some time to turn things things around mm -hmm. and focus on making it a good positive user experience for people searching and, and looking for news again. So we'll definitely keep an eye on this one and uh, see if they can possibly uh, give Dig the makeover that uh, it deserves and perhaps uh, needs to keep on thriving in the web world. Absolutely. I, and I, I, I hope they can do it. I, I think they are starting off on absolutely the right foot. They're being realistic. They're being honest. Um, they're, 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 grabbing a little bit of attention uh, by being bold. And yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be revisiting this on the social hour. But for now, let's talk a little bit about the Olympics because they start next Friday. And Amber, I don't know how much of an Olympics fan you are, but I'm a big one. I love the Olympics. Yeah, well, you know what? I will definitely be tuning in, but probably like you, Sarah, be following along a lot through different social media channels. So kind of excited to see the new Olympic doc org website and what they're trying to do as far as integrate all of the different social media tools to allow people to come there and share their photos, Instagram, Facebook, and all of those other things. Yeah, this is this is awesome. Um, this It's interesting. The, the Olympic Committee has gotten uh, some flack in the past because we heard reports of athletes, which is true, uh, not being able to tweet. Um, there are such uh, kind of delicate sponsorship uh, rules in place. So it's, it's uh, a company, for example, um, who's, who's sponsoring the Olympics would not want an athlete who's maybe sp sponsored by another company or just likes to drink Coke, let's say. I don't know if Coke's sponsoring the Olympics or not. Hypothetical examples here. Um, so there's a little bit of a we're on lockdown um, from, mm -hmm. you know, within uh, the, the, uh, the Olympic uh, athletes themselves, which is always disappointing when you hear about that as an outsider because you want as much of the real thing as possible, um, especially uh, if you know that there is a money-based reason that people aren't tweeting about what they actually want to tweet about. That, that always bothers me. But I love the idea of the, uh, the IOC uh, using tools that they know people are using. They've pretty much picked all of the biggest sites Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, not as big as Facebook, but still a lot of people on Google Plus, Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare. I mean, that's, it's kind of like you've got it covered there with blogs. You've got location based check ins and data. Um, this is, this is data actually that's, that's good for everybody. I mean, it's, it's certainly great for all of, uh, these services to, uh, be, be officially recognized by the Olympic Committee, but good for the committee too, because they get a sense of what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can't tell Sarah when I go to the main website, it is is the integration all going to happen on this main page? Because right now it's just basically like a, a, a an online brochure in terms of what to expect at the Olympics. But do you think we'll see more of a, a news feed or something that's more interactive on this homepage? 
<sighs> you got me. <laughs> I mean, Leo and I this week um, on this week's iPad today. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's it's our latest episode. It's it's up now. We were uh, showing off some Olympics apps, and what's interesting is that the apps are already live in the App Store, of course, because they want you to have them well ahead of time before the opening ceremonies next week. But there's not really much to say besides yeah. here's what this athlete did four years ago or here's a local news story, you know, that's a package about what may happen. But we're not actually in the Olympics yet. So I think a lot of this doesn't go live until um, until we're in the thick of it, because, of course, once the Olympics starts, mm -hmm. it's it's go, go, go. And in fact, there's almost no way to watch everything live because. Uh, we're a variety of different time zones and things like that. But but yeah, I, I, I don't really know. Um, I am interested uh, and I hope that it's not just, hey, follow the Olympic uh, official Twitter account, which is not what I would hope. Yeah, I mean, it looks like they make it easy to search for Olympic athletes through just a search bar on the main page. But it's almost like you want to, and I guess, like you said, we'll see what happens, but you want to see something really dynamic and just mm -hmm. lots of different live feeds and things happening really quickly, almost like you would see on, uh, if you're watching TV and video and, and content being thrown at you on a regular basis. But uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on this too and see what happens. But it looks like a good a good place to go and a good resource if you want to follow along with your favorite athlete who's participating in the Olympics. Absolutely. All right, let's move on now to our social tip of the week, something called flipogram. I'm not familiar <laughs> with this. All right. So uh, I found this on Shiny Shiny, uh, which you know I go to that site all the time. I it's do. based in the UK. And uh, I actually uh, linked up in, to the uh, iTunes store in the UK to check out uh, Flipagram, which they recently featured. The idea being that it will turn all of your Instagram photos into fun, captivating video slideshows. So basically, it will allow you to go through your Instagram photos. You can sort all of the photos. You can select which ones you want. And you can create an interactive slideshow that, that you can then share. Uh, you can can add audio to that slideshow as well. I mean, we've seen services on the web like this before. Um, there's one in particular I'm thinking about that uh, you've been able to use for a while. Uh, but this one is specific just to Instagram uh, photos. So it uh, looks like a fun one, maybe popular in the UK right now. But uh, I don't know if anyone else has had a try as far as using this. But uh, as you post more and more photos to Instagram, it's just a more interesting way to share them. I think Instagram... It Half of the fun of Instagram is watching these third-party services make yeah. cool things from, I agree. you know, the, the, from the fact that there are a lot of people using Instagram who have some great photos and getting creative with this. Flipagram, which, by the way, uh, their website is flipa, f l i p a g r dot a m. So flipagram, but the a m is 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 the end of it. Uh, it ninety nine cents um, in the U S. in the App Store. And on their website, they make it very clear, we're not affiliated with Instagram, we just like the service, this is something that we put together because we're Instagram fans. Um, and you kind of see that from a lot of these Instagram services, but I love this. Make a slideshow mm. with your Instagram photos, and maybe you took, I mean, I just went on vacation recently, so I've got, what, 40 pictures in a row of, you know, these faraway places that I may never go to again. And I'm really proud of all those pictures. You know, I'm, they make me happy. I would love to send that as a slideshow you know, to my mom or she's already on Instagram. But if I knew somebody wasn't and I wanted to give them a quick sneak peek into an event that I participated in or whatever, it doesn't even have to be mm. a vacation. This is great. And for a dollar, yeah, usually anything good. under a dollar, I figure, eh, even if it's not the best app in the world, it might be fun once or twice. Yeah, especially with Instagram, because it's not that easy necessarily to share those photos on Instagram with people who aren't using Instagram or other social sites. So if you, if you spend a lot of time there, and I have friends who do such a great job of posting amazing photos to Instagram, I'd love to see some of their streams in this really fun, uh, interactive way. So just a quick tip if you're an Instagram user and you want a, a different way to showcase what you've done using that app. Love that. That's Flipagram, iPhone only, uh, by the way, at least for now. Little spotlight today for anybody who is a fan of the Bing social search bar. They have now added Foursquare tips. Um, uh, already, um, it had well a variety of, of social integration, like uh, data from Twitter and Foursquare. Um, and this is sort of in that uh, in that social. I guess you could call it like a right hand rail um, of the Bing's. Uh, sidebar, really. I guess that's what you call it. It's more of a sidebar. Now, Foursquare tips are part of that as well. I love this 
because Foursquare tips are um, extremely helpful to me, um, especially when I'm trying to figure out um, in an unfamiliar neighborhood or even in a neighborhood that I'm in all the time, but I just want to do something different, what is a good place to get a drink, you know, get some french fries. I use Foursquare tips a lot, and in fact, I've, I've noticed that when I'm a little bit unsure of whether I should try this cafe out, I'll load up Foursquare tips because often I'm near the cafe, you know, so it'll come up in my geolocated list of places that I might be uh, about to go to. Whereas Yelp, which Yelp, well, Yelp will do the same thing, but Yelp is something that I do more for research purposes before I've even left the house. Um, what, you know, like what cafe, what, what kind of rating does this cafe have on Yelp? But Foursquare tips are great because you're already there and you can see people saying, oh, definitely get the chai. They've got great chai tea here or don't even bother with this dish. It's really terrible or, you know, something in between is general ratings. But I love Foursquare tips. I use them a lot. Um, Amber, I know that I'm a bigger Foursquare user than you are, <laughs> but do you ever... Even if you're not uh, comfortable with checking in somewhere, do you ever see what other people have left as tips behind from yeah. various locations? You know what, Sarah? I'm always amazed with how many great tips they are. I was recently speaking at a, a, a conference for the Children's Miracle Network, and I brought up a, a, ho- a hospital in Toronto and noticed that there were like 4,000 tips for people visiting the hospital, and t- including where to eat, where to get flowers, all of this really great information. And it's almost like they built this very uh, useful community around the hospital itself. So I think that's kind of interesting to see how the tips contribute to uh, to the experience that someone would have at a particular location. So I love the tips. They're awesome. I do too. And I think uh, Foursquare is smart to focus on this. Um, they recently had a whole uh, redesign of their apps, which uh, B-Woogie in, in, our, in our live chat says, I want to use Foursquare but I never remember to use it. Plus, I have no friends who use it. And this is, <laughs> I think, uh, one of the most common reasons that people say, I don't really get Foursquare. It's like, well, you, you either, you can choose to, to either be comfortable with being able to, to check in somewhere where other people know where you are physically. But that aside, most people say, it's just, what's the fun of it? I don't really have anybody else who's using Foursquare, so why would I use it? The way that I think... Foursquare wants to go, and they know this, that people feel this way, is if you are uh, someone who's contributing to Foursquare tips, it doesn't necessarily need to be that traditional social network where you have to have at least 10 to 20 friends for it to be fun for you. You're just contributing to the overall data in the app itself. And the more people who do that, even if be woogie, you and I don't know each other, uh, some tip that I leave the next time you're in Petaluma is going to be helpful to you, and it doesn't really matter if you know me or not. I mean... You could argue that a friend's recommendation means more than a stranger's recommendation. But again, it's that aggregate data that I think I think will help Foursquare uh, become something that's much more than just a network for friends to figure out where they are. Yeah, it definitely. Is. Are. It seems to make a lot of sense. And I think more and more people are relying on the tips and the tips are just getting richer and better over the past uh, little while. So uh, lots of great information there. Got an email from... Oh, gosh, I forgot to say who your name was in our email account. Well, a very nice person who would like uh, to recommend a topic for us next week, Amber, says, I recently read an Ars Technica article about two ride request services in San Francisco. One's called Lyft, Lyft with a Y, and one called Sidecar. Uh, links us to the the article itself, uh, we'll, which we'll put in the show notes. Says the author of this article became part of these services in order to properly explain how they work, what makes them each unique. They're a very social way to travel. They seem perfect for the discussion on the show. I think that we've got a topic to talk about next week. Sounds good very to me. Very cool. Let's do it. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, awesome. Just- yeah, and if anyone else wants to recommend different topics we we can dive into. It's always helpful for us as we put together the rundown and uh, it's great to have feedback from the viewers and listeners. Absolutely. If you want to hear about something, I mean, as long as it works for social, uh, we absolutely uh, would like you to chime in. By the way, Lyft and Sidecar are two sort of Uber type uh, services, but more for uh, Amber driving me from point A to point B because she might uh, feel like she, you know, she could rent out her car, but w- with her as the driver for a period of time. We'll get into it more next week, but the whole thing is very fascinating. Obviously brings up some security issues and all sorts of stuff like that. So 
definitely a good topic for us uh, next week. But this week, we did talk uh, earlier in the show about some some big social media gaffes, but this is more of a, I don't know, one of those social blunders you kind of have to laugh at. <laughs> yeah, you can only laugh, especially at some of the headlines that are online, like this one uh, on uh, Fox website that says Burger King fires three employees in lettuce photo posting uh, posted online. So, Sarah, it looks like there were some employees at a Burger King who had posted a photo of them stomping on lettuce with their bare feet, if I'm correct, and or maybe not bare feet, but definitely with their feet. And they uh, then posted that photo onto uh, a, a website, and uh, it was uh, 4chan onto the image board there. And uh, a couple of 4chan users got pretty savvy and took some of the data included in that image. And they actually traced the photo back to the exact location where it was taken. This is a lesson, I think, for people who do anything like this. And they tracked down the employees and Burger King fired all three of them. Who knows who the people were as far as their involvement? It looks like there was just one person in the picture, but three employees actually got let go because of this. So uh, kind of scary if you uh, think you're posting photos and they are are anonymous online. Absolutely. Yeah, that EXIF <laughs> data. It'll get you. I've heard I've heard stories like this before where this is just uh, it's one of those the person who took the photo, hey, it's probably a very funny photo to them and they think my face isn't in this photo. It's just a pair of boots. You can't exactly. trace it back to me. No one has any that my bosses won't ever know and even if they know they can't prove anything. Well, they probably knew, I mean, you figure, okay, well, you've got the location. You still don't really know which employee it was at this particular Burger King, but there's probably the employee that maybe had been written up a couple of times already, and maybe there were two other employees that were probably on duty at the same time as this employee, and they say, all right, well, enough with all of you. We're not going to have these shenanigans anymore, but um, be careful. Anonymous <laughs> photos, often not anonymous. You really, really have to cover your tracks. Not that I'm you, encouraging you to be stomping on lettuce oh no. at your at your place of establishment. But if you do, you have to be more careful. Darn it. Especially if you remember back to, I think it was the Domino's pizza story, if I'm right, and uh, how those employees did those sick things to the pizzas. And then they posted the video on YouTube and that made the rounds and they were also uh, let go. And I believe there were charges pressed against them. So that happened a few years ago. So uh, you just can't get away. I guess your employer can find you anywhere. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Scary world. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess social media, you know, got to be careful with that because people will talk and they'll share. Reminder that we do love to hear from you. We try to Feature as much of your content, whether it's emails, whether it's voicemails, videos that you send in as possible. Do want to remind uh, uh, you that as far as voicemails and videos go, anything that's 30 seconds or less helps us so much. Uh, we, we have a lot of stuff to talk about in every show. So sometimes we get these great voicemails and um, I want to write you back and say, can you be more concise? But since you sent us the voicemail, I don't know what your email address is. Anyway, long story short, try to keep them quick and concise, quick and concise, and we will feature them in a future episode. Write us at the social hour at twit.tv. It's kind of what you thought it would be, of course. Leave us a voicemail. The number is 2626 S O C I A L. Once again, 2626 social. Or if you record a video, upload it somewhere, send us the link, and we'll try to play it on a future episode of the social hour before we get to amber's rad or fad which is going to be good this week let's take a moment to thank audible they are our second sponsor on this episode of the social hour if you're not already an audible uh customer you are missing out because they have more downloadable titles of audiobooks than you could shake a stick at over 100,000, in fact not 10,000, not 75,000, over 100,000 titles and in fact, um, the latest audiobook that I am going to listen to is written by Elton John. And the reason is, is because I heard an uh, interview with him on NPR the other day. Um, he has a new book out. It's called Love is the Cure on Life, Loss, and the End of AIDS. Um, Elton John has been an, uh, a very, very vocal advocate of um, AIDS research and, and advocacy. Uh, ad advocacy for many, many years. Many of you know that. It's uh, obviously played a lot of benefits. Um, and it's an uh, autobiography. What's cool about it is that he narrates it. And that's the neat thing about Audible. They've got these great people that um, are like professional uh, voice uh, 
audiobook readers. And a lot of uh, these books are, 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 are read by people who are really awesome to listen to. But then you have somebody really famous, like Elton John, who has a beautiful voice. And he reads his own book. And that's really cool. I love those. Because especially when it's something about a person's life and it's an autobiography, it just, it's just really... It's it's that much cooler than if I were just to read the book uh, myself, you know, even an ebook. Audiobooks are great. They're a great way to be able to read either fiction or nonfiction while you're doing other things because your eyes can wander. You know, you're just kind of listening. Um, in my car, I'm a commuter, so it really, really comes in handy. Um, Audible is just, it is awesome. What we can do for you, if you're thinking, okay, it sounds awesome, Sarah, what do you got? If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour, and you're not already a customer, sign up and you get a free book, free book of your choice. Any book that's a one coin book. There's a couple really, really popular books um, that, uh, that are two coin books, but the majority of them are one. So you can just get a free book. It's like, it's like somebody just gave you a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. absolutely free book um, Elton John for example if you're a fan the way that I am that might be your first book and then you can uh, you can try it audible and and get a sense for how awesome it is you can try it free for 30 days by the way get a free audiobook absolutely cost you nothing for that first month and then you've got that very 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 large selection of over 100,000 titles that's audiblepodcast.com slash social hour for the free book and we thank them very much for supporting the social hour. Amber, without further ado, what is rad or is it fat? <laughs> All right. So this is kind of a neat contraption, especially if you are an iPhone user and you have a lot of old images, even uh, if you have uh, uh, old uh, negatives and slides that you want to possibly digitize and get onto your smartphone and then be able to store online. So this is called, uh, it's a little gadget here. And uh, the idea is called iPix to go. And you take your iPhone and you just slot it into the top of this box that uh, it's a fairly large box. Uh, I guess oh, it would be looks yeah. like a printer. Yeah, like a, a small-ish printer, I guess, is the best way to define it. Yeah. Um, you slide your iPhone in, and uh, then you're able to put your photos into the tray at the bottom. It will uh, digitize those photos and uh, put them onto your phone. And you can do the same thing with the little slide tray. So if you want to take uh, uh, any old negatives and slides that you have, you can also turn them into uh, uh, a digital uh, uh, piece of content immediately onto your iPhone. So I thought it was kind of neat it's a it's a bit clunky to i guess to um to actually go through that process of digitizing everything but uh, i don't know sarah what do you think i think it's kind of cool actually i mean this is yeah. i'm looking at this it's listed on firebox.com for 62.69 so for 65 uh dollars you've got a yeah i mean it's a little bit of a clunky device but it's a sort of a small printer that i think okay well if i have a bunch of photos you know paper photos analog photos and I want to digitize them, and I could put them on my phone where I'm more likely to share, frankly. Yeah. That's so much easier, even though, you know, maybe it's not the highest quality. I probably am going to get much better quality if I actually scanned in my photos, you know, on the best quality scanner I, that money can buy. Then I've got it on my computer somewhere, and then I figure out a way to email it to myself so that I open it on my iPhone, and then, you know, it's like, it, for just over... For for I don't know anything under a hundred dollars as far as scanning, especially when you have a huge volume of photos. I do, and it's mm. sort of a constant source of stress for me. It's like God, I've got to scan some of the stuff. You know, I mean, what if there was a uh, you know like a water leak or something, and all my photos were ruined? It's like there are a lot of photos I have that aren't digitized anywhere and this would be really kind of fun because uh, everybody likes seeing it on Facebook when you can see someone uh -huh. has scanned in a bunch of those old photos and, and you see everybody when they were young and you know that that was probably um, a long arduous process. I like this. I think, yeah, I do think it's kind of rad. I suppose it's also kind of scary for people who think that those old paper photos that are sitting in your friend's basements will stay there forever. And all of a sudden, it could be easy to get those instantly onto their iPhones. And I, they do mention in one of the articles I read that they see people using it li exactly like that. So there's an opportunity, you know, right now I'm at my parents' house in Prince Edward Island, and there's a bunch of old photos. I actually just went through some of them this morning, but I could sit there with this little gadget and I could scan them or have them automatically on my iPhone. I could share them on Instagram. I could add filters. I could do lots 
lots of fun stuff with them. So it makes them more accessible and I think more shareable immediately. So for iPhone users, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It is kind of rad. So we'll put it in the rad uh, category. Uh, not a fad. This is probably something that people would do on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and even if this is not the best printer put together, um, hopefully it's we're going to see more stuff like this. This is, a, I mean, this is definitely one of those things where I go, this is a need, a need a lot of people have. It's not yes. just, hey, a cool printer that's kind of weird and maybe you might want it. It's like, I could use this right now. Mm -hmm. We will also have the link to, if you're interested in purchasing this or maybe as a gift, 60, 62, what was it? $63, $62.69. Um, hey, somebody's birthday is coming up. The price is right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it might be, a, might be a pretty cool gift. So we'll put... Um, the link to uh, where to buy it in our show notes. But that is the end of our hour, which was extremely social, Amber. I think we covered pretty much every corner of the social internet <laughs> in this hour. We did. So Yes. Oh, before we go, though, Sarah, I just want to say last week I promised on the show that I was going to watch The Newsroom because you had mentioned it and yes. uh, kind of critiqued it a little bit on the show. And I had a chance to watch the first three episodes of The Newsroom. Uh, I did like it. Uh, I I want to love it because I have, like, you worked in a newsroom over the years. And uh, mm -hmm. it's fun to just kind of see that culture replicated on television. Uh, I think it needs a, a little bit of help. And it looks like Aaron Sorkin recently fired all of his writers and is bringing on a new team of people. He left, I think, one or two people. But um, we'll see what happens. I, I definitely would watch more episodes. And it seems like it'll be a good work in progress. So that's my little review, I promise. That's thank you for the update. You're right. We did we did say that we were going to talk about it. I have um, since watched episode four. <laughs> That's as far along as they are yet, and I more annoyed than ever at that show. I really particularly hated episode four. But I want to hear your thoughts about it, even though this obviously isn't a the newsroom recap show. Um, it does really apply to Amber's and my interests and lives, and and it will be interesting to see um, whether. Aaron Sorkin firing a bunch of his writers is just kind of routine. Hey, fresh meat, let's let's get some new some new thoughts in here. Or if it's a response to some lukewarm reactions from critics and, and the public on the show. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple characters too that I love in the show. A couple that I think that the casting wasn't perfect, but uh, I will try to watch episode four and I will report back, Sarah, because uh, like I said, I want to love it. It just, I, I, it's taking some time. I know, I, I feel the same way. It's like, I care enough to really want it to be better. You know, yes, instead exactly. of just saying, eh, I don't like this, I, I'll never think about it again. I keep watching and going, but they didn't get that right. Anyway, mm -hmm. okay, well, we'll talk about it next we'll week. We'll talk about it more. <laughs> for now, that's it for this episode of The Social Hour. Remember, we are now live on Fridays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. But do catch our show on demand. You can subscribe. You can find us on iTunes. You can find us at our, at our website, twit.tv slash TSH. Um, and thanks so much for watching. We'll see you here, same time, same place next week. Until then, bye-bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.